Hey, good morning, everyone. It is, what is it? It is Tuesday, March 20th, 2018. My name is Jeff Fritz. Welcome back to the live stream. Um, and today I've got a guest joining me. We're going to be, we're going to be talking about analyzers with my guest, Jason Bach. Hey, Jason, thank you so much for joining me today. Hello. Good morning. So I made a mistake. I had a typo when I was promoting the the stream last night, and I accidentally, instead of typing live coding, I typed an S instead of a D, and it looked like live causing. Yeah, which is so, funny because I, I said I was going to be Captain America. Well, I have this little statue. So that's there you go. About, there and you I, go. And I went full Iron Fist today. See that? I've even got the shirt. <laughs> so now, what hat do you have there? That is Marquette University. I, and actually, I typically never wear uh, um, a hat. But I decide not only to wear the cap, but I also have my coffee mug from Marquette there as well. There you go. So, all right, I'll stick with Microsoft Learning today. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I had been I had been running my mouth on on the stream for a little bit about oh gosh be, we we've got these really cool Rosalind analyzers that come with Visual Studio that help to correct and and direct you to build better code easier. Right, mm -hmm. you got the little light bulb that appears, and it gives you simple instructions. But I have no idea how to build these things, and and I I know you're a bit of an expert on this. So, you know, why don't you give the the quick intro of who you are and your experience yeah. with these? So, and I, I'm gonna just plug one thing because you sure, mentioned please. it, which is this book. Sorry about the glare, but .NET see. development using the compiler API. Look at yeah, that. there you go. Um, so yeah, that's. That's a book related to this. So, so real quick, um, just so people know who I am, I, I as you said, Jason Bach. Um, I'm actually out of the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and I work for a company called Magenic. Been there for 17 years now. We do software development consulting firm. Been a Microsoft MVP for almost 11 years now, I think, 11 or 12. Okay. Um, do a lot of speaking, a lot of writing, as I just showed. And one of the things that I've been focusing on Ever since I heard about there, there's this thing, was it back in 2007 or eight called compiler as a service? Yeah. I, I think Anders, like when he would do his The Future of C Sharp talk, and he would just mention this thing really briefly at the end about um, how they're looking at the compiler infrastructure. And they're, they, that like caught my ear a little bit. And I tried to follow as much as I could because this is back when everything was closed source. Mm. There, there were no bits online, and it was unless you were like intimately involved in this project, you really weren't seeing a lot. So I was trying to follow this as much as I could because it sounded really interesting. And then around like 2011 is when they released some preview bits, yeah. and um, the, it, it just seemed like a really powerful thing to me. The fact that you could not only that the compiler was compiler was rewritten to be in C sharp or VB, but also that you could use this API anywhere you wanted. So, so okay, compiler as a service, right? Yeah. I mean, were were you we were we used to be familiar with, you know, the compiler only runs in Visual Studio, and you needed to have Visual Studio in order to build your bits. But it's yeah. different now. Yep, yep. You can all all the packages, everything that is backing all the compiler stuff within Visual Studio, you can reference as NuGet packages anywhere. So I've seen people do some crazy things from a good and bad perspective of, you know, creating code in the browser in terms from a textual representation, but then they ship it off to a server and actually build it there and then show you the results back, um, which is awesome and also scary from a from a security perspective, but it's cool. And yeah, and you Absolutely. can... You can embed this stuff anywhere you want, um, so, so it's, it's really enabling. That that compile code in the browser, ship it off to a server, that's a little bit of how try.net and our friend Maria Nagaga, she's working on that project and more of how do we get .net to be easier for folks to work with in the browser. Um, yep. it's, a, it's a great idea and you're right, it's a security nightmare. How do you make <laughs> sure folks don't do bad things? And, yep. and they're working hard to make sure they prevent those. Yeah, and it'll, it'll be interesting with WebAssembly to see if a, a lot of that specific scenario actually all gets shipped into the browser. So yeah. you could take the compiler APIs and conceivably 
bring them down as you get packages in the browser, and then you do all the compilation there. Oh, that, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know, yeah, I don't think that's how like things like try to try .net or Sharp Lab, I think, is another one. I don't think they work that way yet, but they could. There's an on ramp for them to to switch their compiler model. Absolutely, yeah. and I also when I think about that, and I I think of um, Electron apps those apps that are built on the Chromium framework that that host a full web page and you, you don't see it as a web page but it's a browser hosting a web page that's running javascript yeah. if i can run all of my compiled apps in there and i can do different things because i have compiler as a service things get a heck of a lot more interesting to build native apps as web pages yeah it's very interesting times we live in. <laughs> They're very right. cool too. So oh yeah. So so we had we had talked briefly yesterday. You know, spoiler alert, alert. We talked briefly yesterday. Sorry about that. Um, about trying to get to how how we can simplify some of these ASP.NET Core um, <laughs> typical mistakes that I make and some of the things that that would make it easier by building a Roslyn analyzer. Um, so why don't we go over why don't we go over first to GitHub? I allocated some space so okay. that we could work here today. So here we go. So I have, I, I created a repository called fritz.analyzers. And nice. uh, just some place for us to land a project to work on on some analyzer content. Yep. Um, I'm just going to take a quick pass at the chat room here. Good evening, Dev Lead. And there's our friend Cryptrix, Sushinator, our folks in Europe. It's in the evening over there. Standby Reloading says Electron and Blazor. I think mm -hmm. that's an amazing idea. Yeah, and there's all, and since we're talking about that real quick, um, there's a guy named Frank. I forgot his last name. I think it's Craig, Kruger or Krager. Frank Kruger. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. he, uh, O O U I, mm -hmm. we or however he says it, he's got that working now. So that loads all in the browser. So, so. Frank's project actually will load XAML controls in yep. the browser. Which feels really different. <laughs> yeah, it does. It's, like, hmm. um, it's all Xamarin forums, I think. So yes, he's working yeah. closely with our friend Miguel Diacaso on that. Ah, okay. So I got to be careful. I I sometimes confuse my friends Miguel Diacaso and Miguel Castro, two very ah. different people. <laughs> yes, <laughs> one's really tall. So <laughs> one's really tall. One's a little bit shorter. Yeah. All right. Um, and good afternoon, folks in the UK. 2 p.m. Eighth Paradox is over there. And thank you, Space Shot, for hosting us. Mr. Magoo is back. Great to see him. All right. So I allocated some space over here. But you were telling me that to build an analyzer project, it's not the same as just a class library. It's a little bit right. different. Yeah, you need to the, – the first thing you need to do, and then this actually has become a lot easier in Visual Studio 2017, um, because again, if you're just doing any compiler fun stuff and you just want to play with the APIs, you can download them with NuGet packages. But if you want them as actual analyzers, then you need to do a little bit more heavy lifting, but not too much. Um, so like and last was, night, it, well, yeah, go ahead. There, so there was something I needed to have installed first. I want to make sure that folks see this before be, before we go into the actual project here. I'll start yep. the installer j just to show that one checkbox that, that I had to load up here before this. Uh, there we go. So I'm going to click on my modify my preview version here, so you can see it out here. Now it was under uh, was it under extension development? Yeah, it's the last one. There, there it is. .NET compiler platform SDK. Yep. So with that installed, I can now build analyzers in Visual Studio. Yes. Yes. And right. and again, if if you're once you get really you know familiar with all this stuff, you could you could do it kind of on your own, but the, the the SDK, it brings in a template for you to make it easy to get up to speed onto it. And it, and it also installs, we didn't do this last night, so I want to make sure we, we go through this today. It installs a window called the Syntax Visualizer, which is absolutely essential mm. if you're going to be writing Ancelizer. So it makes it a lot easier to go, what is it? What is the thing I'm looking for? And it, okay. it just, you'll, you'll see what I mean when we get there. Okay. So, so I'm going to do a file new project here. And now it's under extensibility. Yep. And it is uh, analyzer with code fix, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and again, for, for people watching, um, if you've never seen this before, what you would have here if you don't have that SDK installed is 
I think the C Sharp was it item template, project template, and extensibility project V6. And so yeah. the other three templates are what get what get installed. Uh, excuse me, what gets installed. Okay. The analyzer one that you're going to pick is if you want to build analyzers. The refactoring one is if you want to build refactorings. And then the third one is, again, if you just want to play with the API. So just explain real quick what the difference is between the two. Um, an analyzer is meant to be something that's looking for mistakes or mm -hmm. potential problems in your code. So they run you know, pretty much as, as you're adding code, removing code, editing code. Um, if you're saying, hey, I want to look at something with a method definition. Anytime you create a method, it's going to fire. Uh, they're also part of the build process. So um, if you actually look at CSC, there's now a switch there. It's been there now since 2015 where you can say, here's an analyzer, an assembly that contains analyzers, include this as part of the, uh, included as part of the build. So real quick, CSC, for folks that haven't seen that, that's mm -hmm. the C-sharp compiler at the command line. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, which is a good point because sometimes I ask people, um, kind of as a trick question if I'm interviewing them, what's the compiler for C-sharp? And they'll say Visual Studio. And, well, they're not right, but it makes sense because, you know, most people are just, they're in Visual Studio, they yeah. compile and they run. And so... It shows yeah. the level of abstraction they've worked at. They've worked in Visual yeah. Studio. They haven't had to go down and call MS Build directly or yeah. call into the compiler directly. Yeah, I've ne and honestly, I've never, I don't think I've ever run CSC directly because I just, it never comes up. Um, sure. So, so that's what an analyzer does. A refactoring is something These that ones. you want to potentially make your code better but it doesn't necessarily break your code or it's not wrong if you keep it that way so um, there's a there's a refactoring that is added in um, visual studio for example with some of the new language features in c sharp that you can do the out you know the out var instead of declaring the variable on top for like in try parse mm -hmm. you can now declare the variable in line when you do um, an out variable and i think that's a c sharp seven feature Yes, I think so. I yep. think you're right. Um, so the refactoring basically says e either way is fine, but if you want to do it the new way, which is basically a one less line of code, um, there's a refactoring that's offered, and then you you can just you know, initiate that. And, your code. Yep, exactly. So those don't run all the time, and um, they have a little bit more flexibility in terms of how far they can get into your code. They can actually look through all the projects and solutions. Analyzers have to be a little bit more restricted. Mm. So okay. So that that's the difference between the two, and we're gonna pick the analyzer one for this one. Let's give it a shot. Creating the project. Right, it should be writing it into that folder, right? There it comes. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. So I've got a project, and it's it's already got a bunch of code here for me. Yes, it does. Um, uh, before we look at the talk about the code real quick, um, just so people know, this analyzer template, what it does is it creates three projects. A project that contains what's meant to be the host for all your analyzers. That's just a class library. And that's in .NET Standard 1.3. Okay. The original template for 2015 did it as a PCL, but they've updated it now for 2017. So it's a little better. A PCL, that's a portable class library. That's the way that we used to try to get code that works in all the different .NET frameworks. Right. Yep. All right. So that's one project. Then it creates a test project because, you know, should be writing tests. So that's Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Everybody loves it, a good test. And then it has an extensibility project. And what that allows you to do is, yeah, the third one, it, it allows you to, if you run that, you'll actually start a new instance of Visual Studio with your analyzers essentially already installed. So okay. it's a it's a nice quick way to do some end-to-end -end and integration testing and see does it actually really work in Visual Studio. Yeah. But analyzers they get added into my project, not specifically into Visual Studio, right? Well, it depends. There's two ways to deploy them. So okay. the um, you can deploy the V6, the extensibility project, to other people, and then they can install them, and that works fine. The The way that works then is those analyzers will run for anything that you do in Visual Studio. Uh, 
Okay. But they but they won't fail the build. So if you set one of the severity levels to them as being error, mm. it will show up as a red squiggle. It will show up in your error list, but the build will still succeed. Okay. So if you install analyzers with a NuGet package, which is what's you know that can get produced with the first project, um, then it's per project. Then it's whatever um, project you install them with. Um, but then they will fail the build if they're error. So okay. it kind of okay. kind of depends on what you're looking to do. Typically, I would install analyzers with each project because if it's trying to tell me something that I'm doing wrong, I want it to get in my face and fail the build. So, <laughs> all right, that makes sense. So, so this is Fritz Analyzers Analyzer. Now that's a mouthful. That's like a <laughs> yeah. Java Object Factory factory. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. The, the, the default name is 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 interesting because it just takes that project name and then adds analyzer on there. But what this does out of the gate is it creates an analyzer that does something kind of silly, but at least it gets you familiar with some of the infrastructure you got to get set up. So if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, um, well, actually with analyze symbol there, mm -hmm. hey, you know what? You never sent me a live share. I, I actually just sent it. It's hiding in the chat. At the ah, bottom okay. of the the Skype chat there. Okay, let me copy that link and then let me come over here. So Jason's and... going to get connected with Visual Studio Live Share. For those of you that haven't seen this, this is a way for us to collaborate by sharing sharing my Visual Studio eh, code, not just code, but all the compiler things that go on around it. So Jason can get IntelliSense from my Visual Studio that I'm hosting here. Now it works between Visual Studios, it works between Visual Studio Codes, and crosswise between Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code. There we go, you can see Jason in, in the file now. Yep. There he is right there. Um, but And it also works for folks on Mac and Linux that are using Visual Studio Code. They can connect in to folks on Windows or on other operating systems and be able to work with that. So we're gonna use this so we can collaborate and pair program on this analyzer we're gonna build here today. Yeah. So, um, and when we were playing with this last night, you know, that was the first time I've actually tried it. And it's, it's a little bit of a, of a head trip in a way, um, yeah. in terms to get used to, uh, I'm so used to doing either shared, um, uh, like sh share your desktop and then looking at it and I'll tell somebody, okay, this is where you gotta do it. And you're like ye almost yelling at them, just move up five lines. Cause they, they're not, they can't, they, it's funny when you pair a program with somebody, because if you're watching somebody as they're coding, you almost have to put like a buffer of time there and just wait for the person who's coding to kind of catch up. Because it seems like if you're watching somebody as they're doing it, you pick up things quicker than the person who's actually coding. Mm -hmm. um, so so when I've done that before, it's it's been a little frustrating. This is like, I can just move and I can go right there and start typing. It's awesome. So <laughs> and, and right, folks have seen this type of behavior in, in Word when they share documents with, with somebody in Word and they're both yeah. open and working on it. You also see this in, in Google Docs, those types of products. Um, and as standby reloading, we, are, it, we don't have live code sharing coming to try.net in the short term. It may be mm -hmm. on the longer range roadmap, but it's not on the current set of plans. It might be in the parking lot for that project. Yeah. All right. Oh, and, uh, and somebody said in the chat um, about the framework dropdown. That's something to point. I think you should point that out. Just bring that window up again because it's not sure, obvious at first. So we we moved the framework dropdown. It was up here, and it was a little bit annoying. But it, it, to try and you know go back, nobody really looks at this top bar. But when you are creating a new project, it's now down here underneath of those things that you need to complete when you're choosing a new project, right? I need to specify my name. I need to specify where I'm writing it to. And then, oh yeah, I should choose my framework. Well, instead of having to go all the way back up here and go find it again, set it yep. right before you're creating the application. Yeah. Yep, that's nice. I like that. So, all right. So all right. we're back here. So, so the first project that we were talking about that would be really neat to make as an analyzer, right? Let's, let's, can we talk about that just for a second? Sure. So um, in ASP.NET Core, there's the concept of middleware. And there's three keywords that you should use when you name your middleware. And that's use, map, and run. So let me run over. There's actually a piece of documentation around this. And it's right here. It's 
out on docsmicrosoft.com and it says right here, request delegates are configured using run, map, and use extension methods, right? Uh, use is an extension method that says, do this thing and continue on in the pipeline, just like you kind of see here. Um, run says, do this thing and stop, you know, and then, you know, return back out the, the middleware, you know, don't pass it on to something else. And map says in this case, in this situation, do this thing and it'll decide whether to continue on or not. So I think what we were talking about doing was, well, let's, let's put something together that when you build middleware, it kind of enforces that you, you name your extension method appropriately, starting with run map or use. Right. All right let's go and back then to the other, the other one too was the, um, configure services with I service collection. Oh. Uh, sure. that they sh right, that they should all, if you're writing an extension method, they should all start with the the word add. Yeah, um, right, so uh, registering services, right? They all start with either add transient or add singleton, but if you're going to wrap that up so that you, you have an extension method that registers a whole bunch of stuff for you, like add DB context registers entity framework for you, it, we and add MVC. If you're going to build your own thing, you should probably have it start with add as well, and then whatever yeah. the feature is that you're building, instead of services dot make my new extension cool thing work. You know, and that's a little right. bit harder to discover. Let's let's yeah. kind of enforce these standards. Yep, and that's that's exactly the one we want to create today. Is this, this isn't going to necessarily be incredibly complicated, but it will be nice because it, it like it, exactly forces that naming standard. Um, this happens all the time in .NET. If you create an attribute, you should end it with the word attribute. If you create a new exception, it should end with the word exception. It, well, it doesn't break code, but that's that's a convention that you that everybody does. So you should force that. What, what was the name of that old tool that we used to have that, that would enforce the different naming standards? Well, um, there's there's two of them. There's style cop and FX cop. FX cop. That's what I'm thinking of. Yes. Yeah. Right. And you you would put that into your build process in your CI, and it would throw an error, and and it was it was like the right. It was like the naming enforcement. Uh, cops would come down on you. You didn't name this right. And... Right. It's interesting that you bring up FX cop though, because uh, not only was that naming, but that was also things like it, it was smart enough to go. You may not be disposing an object. Yeah. Um, so it, it was actually even more powerful than that. And it, you, and you weren't now, using the dispose pattern properly, those right. things like that. Yes. Yeah. And now there's um, work underway to get all those FX cop or what's called code analysis in Visual Studio all written so that they're done within the thing we're going to use here, which is an analyzer. So it's a, there's actually an FX cop analyzers project out there in NuGet. Oh, very cool. Um, yeah. Because so I can still get that same functionality. Yeah. Because the problem with, FX cop is that you had to build first and then it would look at your assembly and do analysis on it. These analyzers, like the one we're going to write now, happens, they, they essentially get run as soon as you're typing. So their feedback is a lot quicker. So, okay, okay, hang on. They're reading my text as I'm typing it and they're immediately giving feedback. Yep. That's awesome. All right. <laughs> so, so this is the analyzer's analyzer. Yeah. So this, this that sounds this, confusing. Uh, yeah, well, we could rename this if you want. Um, but just a quick talk about what this one does is essentially it gives an example of if your if your class name has any lowercase letters, it's going to flag it as an error, which is kind of silly. But um, it's it's an easy one that you can run and go, oh, this is what it's doing. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, there seems like there's a fair amount of code here, and we'll clean some of this up later. But essentially, the, the one you want to look at is initialize because this specifies the thing that you want to, your analyzer to look at. Okay. So in this case, there's a there's a bunch of register methods off of context, and you can specify you know whatever it is that you're trying to look at in your code. In this case, it's saying, hey, hey I want to look so for a symbol. Let's see yeah. what that looks like. All right. So I can register code block actions, operation actions, semantic models. So these are yeah. different things for it to look for. Yeah. So the, okay. the, the the way I look at it, and this may be technically wrong, but the, the way I've always kept the mental model in my head is 
Um, the, the syntax tree is essentially just all the pieces that are in your code, all the space, all the trivia, all the um, visibility, accessibility uh, values, all that stuff. Okay, um, so so for folks who aren't who right who who aren't um, um, really into the language, right? Though, yeah. So e keywords, all of these keywords are part of the syntax tree. Yep. Okay. Exactly. And actually, since we're here, why don't we bring that window up? Because I think it's really helpful. So if you go to edit, I'm sorry, not edit, uh, view, mm -hmm. and then other windows. Uh, other windows. Okay. You should see a syntax visualizer it's over there. option under there. I'm looking. <laughs> uh, let's see. Syntax. I the love playing. Down. Yeah, I love playing games like that with... Uh, with chroma key. All right, so syntax tree. Now, should I just, should I dock it on the side here somewhere? Yeah, I put it to the left. That's usually where I put it, so. All right, so I will dock it right here above me. Yeah. There it is. All right, so then when you got that, and then you click on your code, what you should see is the syntax tree rendered in that window. You so, should. Holy crow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. All right, so th is this the syntax for this method or is this the syntax for getting to this location? The, this syntax visualizer is everything in the file that you've currently opened. Okay, so so my mouse here on register symbol action on line 33, this is all of this stuff above this is everything in the class leading into this initialize method and register symbol action is this right here. So is yeah. this dot token? Oh, that's that. Yep. Okay. All right. I got it. Yeah. So so the, the, the point of the syntax visualizer is it gives you everything that the, the compiler did to create the syntax tree for this code. So it does look a little overwhelming at first, but it's helpful that if you are writing an analyzer and there's a specific thing you're looking for in the tree, you can just type some code and then see it in the visualizer and go, oh, that's the node I'm looking for. So so let me let me just back up a second I, because we've also got the class view window. So where I'm at here in this initialize, that's right. I'm, I'm seeing the exact same thing, right? If I were to look at this, right? And I have, where's the method here, right? This mm -hmm. is showing me the, the English, if you will, the, the human right. readable language, and, and me pointing to this is exactly the same as what the machine is seeing, what the compiler sees here. Yes. Okay. Right. But, but the Got syntax it. tree um, is just the guts of it. It, there's, it does tell you some things like this is a class, this is a method definition, and so on. Okay. But it doesn't give you a lot of context or semantics. For example, it, you can't tell from a syntax tree if a method invocation is an express is an extension method. Oh, okay. Because it hasn't figured it out yet at that point. That's why you sometimes will go up what I consider a level higher, and you'll go to the semantic model. The semantic. And so, model. okay. Yeah. So, so to me, the semantic model is kind of. Again, this may be wrong, but the way I think about it is it gives you more information about your syntax tree, but it's not quite to the point of something you would do with like reflection or a metadata library. Okay. But it does then have more smarts about what's in your code. So for example, you can look at a method and you'll have a property on it like is extension method, which we're going to use for this analyzer you're writing, mm. um, which is awesome. So Okay. So again, it depends, you know, as you do more and more of these, it depends on what you're looking for. Generally, if you can get it from, you know, if you get it from this uh, syntax tree, if you can get, to get down that low, that's a little bit arguably quicker. But if you need more information, then use things like what you're seeing here in the example, reg register symbol action. That's at the semantic model level. Okay. So that that's just what all those register methods are doing. And okay. in this case, again, they're just trying to find... Uh, essentially types, classes or structs that you've defined. And so this is nice because this is a filtering option. If you, if the analyzer ran for everything that you were typing, that would make the experience in Visual Studio just awful. Oh, it'd drag. it drag. Would, it would be analyzing every keystroke. Right. Oh. 
So this basically says to Visual Studio or the compiler, hey, I don't care about if they're typing in a method or if they're putting in an event. I only care if you're hitting a class definition right now. Then call this analyze symbol method. And that's what the, the named type is saying. Register a symbol action to look for a named type like a class. Yep. And here's the callback to fire yes. when you find a class. Got exactly. it. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So then in the analyze symbol, now it's kind of up to you. What do you want to do with it? Okay. Uh, so, so what you're seeing down there is you have your context symbol and you got to cast it. Though this is this one right here. Can, yeah, we can just do like what I call hard cast. You don't do the as because it, it should never be called unless it was a name type symbol. Because we requested it here. Yep. Got it. Yep. So then you have that. And then it's, you know, again, with looking at lowercase letters, you can say, hey, look at the class name and look if there's any lowercase letters in the name of it. Okay. That's what that if statement does. And if so, then you report a diagnostic. And so what will happen is if somebody types in a class name that's got lowercase letters, you'll see a red squiggle there. Okay. That's, and, what, uh, that's what a rule is. Well, the rule... Oh, the rule is this up here. Yeah, the diagnostic descriptor that describes essentially the thing that is going to be wrong in somebody's okay. code. And so you create the diagnostic based off of the description, and then you report it in the context. And that's what's going on here on line 48. Yeah. Yep. So, th so this is what will pop into my error list as a warning. Yes. In fact, I think, does it do this? Yeah, as a warning. Yep. Very cool. Because that's how they defined it up in the that rule field. So let me – so – here on line 25, let's just scroll over so we can see the whole thing there. Mm -hmm. So diagnostic severity warning, that puts it in as a warning. Yep. All right. Yeah. And you can change that. I mean, if you want to make the default an error you, or a suggestion or a none, I think those are the four values. Okay. It's up to you. And then if when people install it, they can change that. You know, if they find that's too annoying or they yeah. want to ramp it up, they can do that. Okay. Let me, um, I'm going to so, turn on word wrap while we're going here. Okay. Because there's a lot of code off the side here. And where yeah. I normally like to be able to just scroll back and forth, I think this is going to be a little easier for all of us to be able to read the code. Yep. I got you before that standby reloading. I see that. I already asked it for it in the chat room. Cool. All right. So we want to we want to rename this. We want to start talking about how to inspect those extension methods. Um, yes. So do you actually, do you want to run this quick? Um, sure. So, All right. Be, okay. But before you do that, go to uh, solution explorer. There should be a code fix class in there as well. Uh, this one code fix provider. Yeah. All right. So you don't have to create one of these with each, um, diagnostic or analyzer that you, I'm sorry, I better get my terms right. With each analyzer that you write, you don't have to create a code fix because in some cases, you just want to report the error, but to automatically do a fix would just be way, way too hard. Mm. But if you can, if you can provide a fix, then you can do so. Like, so that in this case, the fix is make everything uppercase. Okay. And that's awesome because um, then it's like when I, I get the compiler telling me an error and it's saying, you didn't do this right. It's, and it's like, that's half the story. You can, so you told me I'm stupid. That's great. But could you actually then fix Tell it? Tell me, how do I fix this? Right. Or just fix it for me. And so that's what a code fix does. And even better with a code fix is once we run this, you'll see that you'll get the options to fix it um, where it currently is in the document or across the entire solution. Okay. So, so that's awesome. So if I just click start, it'll launch and install this V6 into another Visual Studio instance. Right. Yep. All right. So let's do that. Come on, Visual Studio. It's not using the .NET Core compiler. Right. <laughs> the fast one. So I think I just saw it. Yeah, there, there it goes. So this is, this is nice because it's opening up another version of Visual Studio. This is called the Experimental Hive. And it, so it will just install this V6 with your analyzers into this version. So it's not going to like pollute your 
your normal Visual Studio. My my working Visual Studio that I was in. Right. All right. Yep. So let's let's open, and then I'm just going to open my my Stream Tools project. Yep, that's fine. All right. So I will go C Dev, Fritz dot Stream Tools, and then come on, show me my solution file. And I notice it runs just a little bit slower. I'm a little guessing, bit. Yeah, it's got all the debug code running in there. Yep, and you can also run the V6 as in debug mode. So while you're you're in that experimental hive, you can actually put breakpoints in your analyzer and your code fix, and it works just fine. Mm. So yeah, the, the first time you do this, it feels a little. Uh, slow but once it gets past that so just open up any class file it doesn't matter which one all right and i, I want to thank standby reloading for the for the cheer there 100 bits thank you very much um appreciate that and yes i turned on word wrap <laughs> uh, there ah oh, look at that it was loading all my preferences all right so yeah gonna... it, it it has to sync that too the first time so yeah let's open my startup class because that's where we're going to end up at Yep. So if you scroll up to where it actually is to find the class. There we are. What you should see, if this all worked. Is... I'm still doing my Docker container here behind me. Oh, okay. Go on, Docker. Yeah, eventually once it runs to the point, it should So now, say... yeah, I've got the new icon here. that It still says light bulbs. Um, but it's now, it's like a paintbrush or something. I forget. Yeah. They changed the icon here. Our friend Casey Ullenhuth and her team are building this. Yep. Okay, so look at that. So I have make uppercase, generate overrides, suppress Fritz analyzers. That's a bad idea. <laughs> Don't suppress me, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so I, it, it gave me the red squiggle, like you were saying. And if yeah. I mouse over it there, I've got the little light bulb that has a red X for quick actions. Now, it was a paintbrush, and it just went away, and it changed. That's interesting. I don't know about that, but if so now if you pick make uppercase, but <clears throat> just let it show the thing to the right. What it's going to do is eventually show a diff screen. It should, man. This it, it'll show the preview. Right. You need more like bits or memory or something. It's good. Tell you what. Let it, me just check on this machine. Make sure it's on high power, high performance. It feels like it's tired or something. It's yeah. It's <laughs> on high can, performance. So he said Jeff can be suppressed. Yes. What? <laughs> That's our friend Saduki. Hey, great to see you, sir. Uh, stand by reloading. Uh, there are those dev chatter emotes. Yes. You can also, subscribers on my chat get, uh, on my channel get uh, .NET bot emotes. So that's kind of cool. All right, so I'm going to mouse back over make uppercase, and we should see that preview pop up. We should. Here. It's taking its good old time. Yeah, there's Brendan showing off the .NET bot. <laughs> so, of course, right? Do you have Windows? <laughs> yeah. Do you have Windows Update running in the background? No, I don't. <laughs> I have this machine locked down. It's not even on slow ring. It's not even on an insider ring. I took it out of all the rings yeah. because... It, yeah, you don't want to have things breaking left and right. Um, what it should do... The demo gods are not happy, but what it should do is show a, a window essentially to the right of it that gives you a diff of what it would look like when you change this. If you Before decide to accept the, if you decide to accept the the code ref, uh, code fix, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, and then it will have the the links down at the bottom of it saying, I think document project or solution. Do you want to fix all of them? Wherever this knows, and you don't want to do that because that will uppercase everything in your solution, and I don't think you'd be happy with that. No. A uh, question in the chat room from Sushinator. One thing I noticed, analyzers keep being installed by the debug instance of Visual Studio, I even if by then I work on another analyzer project. Is this a known issue or just me? Mm. I, that sounds like it's just you. Yeah, I'm not sure I've ever run into that. I have occasionally run into a case where if I'm updating an analyzer project and I rerun it in Visual Studio with the um, the V6, sometimes it gets, for lack of a better term, screwed up, and I can't explain 
like what or why or how. Um, uh, yeah, look, so the, the references here are reloading. There's definitely something going on here. <laughs> yeah. You're, let's, you're, you're... let's try a simpler project. Okay. That, that might actually, actually, if you just create a new project and just have the one class file in it, that should be a sufficient. Yeah, let's and, just create a class library. Yep. Typically what I do is I create what I call an integration test project. And then I just put in code within that project that exercises some of the cases I'm trying to look at. You know what? That's a great idea. I'm going to create it uh, inside of uh, my analyzers project. Um, let's call this uh, integration test. And the solution name, I'll just call this tests. And I'll let it create that directory. So that I end up with a test folder inside my analyzers that has yep. this. Because then they get, you know, with your Git repo, they'll just come in with it as well. So now this should be quicker, hopefully. And it should get the class to eventually come up and say that you're not uppercasing it. There, I've got a green line. Contains lowercase letters. There, that's good. So now we should be able to get the code fix. There it is. There we go. So that's what we were looking for. All right, yeah. so it's recommending we uppercase it. I can preview changes. Yeah, this is what you were saying. Fix all occurrences. So everywhere that I have a class that's got the mixed case, it'll go find it and rename Make everything it look to like, uppercase. Like Fortran or COBOL or something. I don't know. So. Oh, everybody loves Fortran. <laughs> all so. right. So, I mean, that looks that that looks very friendly, very easy to do. But, I mean, there was clearly, you know, a couple dozen lines of code just to force this to uppercase. Yes. Yep. All right. What, and what I found, we'll we'll start actually creating the, an analyzer for one of the cases you're doing. But what I found by doing this is it takes a little bit of time and just playing around with what is it that I'm actually looking for in code. Uh, but once I get to that point of figuring it out and writing the actual analyzer and code fix code, other some other than some of the boilerplate that we talked about before. The actual code fix analyzer code is typically not that much. You'd think it'd be oh, a terrific. lot, but it, it ends up not yeah. being a lot of code to write. So, so uh, which is cool. Okay, so I'm just going to apply that. My entire project now has uppercase classes. It's only really this one, but... Um, if you added a class two, like if you undid it, if you did a control Z... So if I did... So here, let's just do public class, and we'll call this some other class name. Yep. And it's going to get grumpy with me about this one. And then do it, just make me another class. Public class, another class. Yep. So it's hopefully, be... if, yeah, if you pick one, and, and then I'll just control say, period. change them all in the solution or whatever, it doesn't matter. And it's going to show me all the ones, gives me that preview, apply, and then they all get modified. Yep. Nice. So, and we didn't have, we don't have to write that stuff, that, that window with the framework, with the preview, that's all being handled by Visual Studio. Yep. Correct. You, we literally just have the code that says, take the text and make it uppercase. Yep. I mean, literally text uppercase. Yeah. I so, mean, this is string manipulation. This is easy. Yeah. By it's the way, getting why? there. <laughs> I'm trying to get back to the uh, your code. You know, Visual Studio Preview is saying not responding. Come on. So let me close this other Visual Studio. It, oh, it, that's why. Yeah, because you're. That, yeah. That may be the reason why. So there we go. The de we've been told that the debugger for um, for Visual Studio only really hooks up and works well with um, with Node and ASP.NET Core projects right now. Ah, uh, okay. So did you actually run that in the debugger? Did you just launch it with like F5? Yep. Ah, uh, that's probably also why I was a little slow. So that, that makes, I didn't know, I didn't see that that's what you're doing. It might have it's been trying to pass that debug context back and forth. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. You know what? This is, um, I'm just going to restart the program and I'll have to get back on the, the live share because it just, it's just didn't want to come back. Okay. So give me a couple seconds here. So but why, while let's, it's going down, yeah. Let's answer let's, a couple questions in the chat okay. room. You'd really let's, want to adjust that analyzer, so the default analyzer here, to look for the camel case instead, right? Right? I, you know what? I actually think there are some oh. analyzers folks built that do that, that enforce camel yes. case or Pascal case appropriately. Yeah. 
if you wanted to. Again, the, the, the example that's generated is just to show you kind of how the infrastructure works. Okay. Um, and then you can go off and do whatever you want with, with whatever you want to do. So if you want to do an analyzer that does that, go right ahead, rock on. That that's perfectly fine. You're not you're really not limited at all by what you can do. Now, to be to be clear, the analyzers run inside of full Visual Studio. Do they run in .NET Core projects when I do a build? They yes, they will. Um, okay. If you especially if you in, if you install them into the project, like as a NuGet project, mm -hmm. or I'm sorry, NuGet package, then they're automatically included as part of the build. Oh, and they'll, cool. they'll fail the build if they violate something. So, okay. yes. And then the other question we have here, Dark dark Lejad. Um, so this would be a potential way to say, offer easy upgrade paths internally. Change deprecated method X to Y. Or are those are there far better ways to make life easier? So you, you would have the obsolete tag that you would put on things like standby reloading is suggesting there. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't be a bad idea to have an analyzer that that not just picks up the obsolete tag but then offers that that code fix suggestion i think yeah that that, that would be potentially one way is just to use the obsolete attribute that might give you what you're looking for but you can also do something if you want to build your own way of handling deprecation is to say i know this this method is going away and i want to just rather than tagging it with with metadata maybe i'll just write an analyzer to look for that and then say use this method instead okay that's another way to do it and if you're able to write a code fix that just rewrites it to use the other method instead you're golden yep. that makes life so easy for your developers right okay um arzika 24 thank you for the follow i appreciate you joining us over on where is that on twitch cool all right back up and running it looks like you're back connected Yep. So let's just look at this code fix real quick, and then we'll actually write an analyzer for you. Um, so this make case uppercase. Um, the I have to keep. My, I got my other monitor here, but I'm like, no, I've got a live share. I can just look at it here. Uh, I gotta get used to that. Um, so the first four lines of code may look a little weird, and honestly, I typically will copy and paste this code whenever These writing ones code fix here. No, in the uh, make uppercase async. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. You're right, you're right. Uh, register code fixes async. I'm looking at the wrong spot. So yeah, those those first four lines of code, essentially what that's trying to do is, because the code fix doesn't always run. It only runs if the user said, hey, I want to bring up the light bulb. I want to do control period. Then this runs. So what this code fix has to do is get back to where the analyzer found the error in the first place. So that's that's this find token diagnostic span start parent ancestor herself, blah 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 blah. blah. <laughs> so this is literally finding in our in the case of this the class name. Yeah, it's going back to the type declaration syntax and going and so you're back now at the syntax level, which is fine. You can get to the semantic um, uh, model if you need to, but this gets you back to this is where the, that class that type is defined. And so that's what those first four lines of code are doing. Once you get back there, once you get back to that point, then you can say register code fix on the context. And what you're registering is up to you. That's what make uppercase async is doing. Is, is it saying, I want to create a class with the name that's all uppercase. So, so the title that's being passed in here, right? This mm -hmm. is make uppercase, right? That was the text yep. that was on the light bulb that said, here's a fix for you. And yep. Title is somewhere up here. There it is. Okay. Yep. It, we so, may want to localize that with a resource string, but I got it. Okay. Yep, you could do that. And so then what make uppercase async does is it just looks at the type declarations identifier text, makes it all uppercase. And then this is where it gets a little interesting too, is one thing to keep in mind with the compiler API. All the syntax trees are immutable. So you can't just go in and say, I want to change this class name to all uppercase because, well, one reason is you, if you were able to do that, then all of a sudden you change that and what's in the, the developer's IDE would suddenly change right away. And that would suck because maybe they don't want to accept it, you know? Okay. So when you're going to actually provide a code fix, you need to create a whole new immutable version of your fix. And that's why you get that diff, which is nice. 
Okay. I can show the differences between the two. So what that rest of the code does there is down in here. Yeah, it gets it gets a semantic model, and then it gets the declared symbol. So you're back to actually being that type symbol. You're now at the semantic level, okay. and now noticing that what it's doing is it's saying, um, I want to go all the way up to the solution. And there's a special class that they have in the compiler API called renamer. So what this does is it says, based on mm -hmm. the new name variable, um, first type symbol, go across yeah. you know, the solution, yep, and say, I want to rename this everywhere. OK, so go across the entire solution, go find the type symbol so that, OK, right. here's the but new what, name to rename it with. Yep. But what you come out with with new solution, what the return value is, is not the solution that you have currently loaded. This is it. a whole separate and immutable solution. So only if the developer accepts the code fix will it actually update your code that you have loaded in Visual Studio. Okay. All right. I get it. All right. All right. So let's actually write one for you. So should we start with the analyzers analyzer or do you want to start with a new class um you can i was and and just i just so everybody knows i've actually gone through and written one just as a backup but i want to see i want to help jeff learn how to do this so we're going to write one on the fly okay um but i but i already got it working so we we have a workable solution so we have a fallback yes we do so when i um, mess up <laughs> so it's up to you you can you can delete, you know, the analyzer code fix that you have there. You can leave it there if you want to have that class renaming thing. You can edit it. I personally, once I, I've only looked at this. Uh, when, or let me rephrase this. Whenever I use this template, the, one of the first things I do is delete those two classes because okay. I just don't want them there. So. What's in the tools folder here? Oh, okay, just oh, some PowerShell yeah. to install it. All right. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, for right now, just to make things a little bit easier on me without having to go and and uh, just so these are sticking around so I can refer back to them. Let's yep. create a new item. Okay. And then is there an analyzer class in here? I don't think so. Um, so I just usually create a class. There might be an extensibility, but I'm not sure. Okay. So uh -huh. can I call this something like middleware analyzer, middleware naming analyzer? It's what, whatever you want to call it. The, the thing I think we should focus on for the rest of the time is um, is the iService collection one because we're just looking for those to start with the word add. Okay. So, so how, whatever so you want to this, call it. So for this, I'll analyzer. call it middleware naming analyzer. Okay. All right. Now this is a public class. Yep. And you should see the class pop up on your side. Standby reloading is suggesting we need an analyzer to analyze your analyzer. That's funny. A what? An analyzer <laughs> to analyze your analyzer. You know what's funny about that is I think there's actually analyzers that Microsoft has written to help you with writing analyzers. Yes. So that's actually a, a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right. So uh, I should I should inherit from, right, if this is a... I inherit from Diagnostic Analyzer. Yes. All right, so let's start there. Yeah, we'll Diag have to do a little bit of copy paste or whatever for now. And then I can control dot on that. Yep, using Diagnostics. And then mm -hmm. there's probably a couple things to implement here. Yep. You're also going to need that attribute that's on the top of the class. Uh, diagnostic Analyzer, language names, C Sharp. OK, so, oh, wait a sec. So I could create a diagnostic analyzer for VB or F sharp. For VB, not for F sharp. Yes, I can. It's right there. What is? They, oh, okay. I take that back. That very cool. All right. Way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, okay. So I want to focus on C sharp because I am C sharp Fritz. I mean, let's yes. start there, right? Um, all right. So I have, and you were saying we wanted to focus on on the array. Was, is it this array that supported diagnostics? What am I? Yeah, so supported diagnostics is essentially saying, what diagnostics do you support? Mm. Um, and for some reason, I don't have that class showing up on my share. There's a there's a refresh button at the top of Solution Explorer. You might have to punch. Okay. And it, 
John Galloway was telling me he needed to do that every now and again to get it to sh get new files to show up. Within the uh, Solution Explorer. Yeah, huh. one of the toolbar buttons up here, right? Um, where is it? Pending changes. Sync with that, not sync. Uh, I don't see it here now. Hmm. Yeah, because for some reason I, I'm not seeing... Uh... You're not seeing the new file. Yeah. Uh, try disconnecting and reconnecting. Okay. Your session. Might need to build for him to see it, they're saying. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, we'll do a build real quick. Um, and there, there's our friend Fierce Kittens in the chat room now. Good to see you. Uh, might need, uh, yeah. All right. You did add this to the, yeah, you did, to the van. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. So if I leave the collaboration session and just come back, let's just do that. Yeah, try and force it to to pop. Oh, look, there's our friend John Galloway. At one point, I actually had to restart Visual Studio to get latest files, I think. That feels bad. <laughs> yeah. We don't want well, to do that. This is preview. I, I, oh my I gosh, have yes. zero tolerance with this because, you know, it's still a work in progress, so that's fine. There we go. I uh, can see in the file now. Okay, cool. So... Uh, so the, the supported diagnostics, um, the, the getter there is basically just saying, which, which ones do you support? So this is where that, um, diagnostic descriptor was at the top of the file with the analyzer it creates. If you go back to that file. So where to go? New diagnostic descriptor. Here's the rule. Yeah. And so, the supported says, create that rule. Okay. So yeah. this is where we need to define our rule that we're going to enforce here. Yep. Now you can use all the localizable stuff if you want. For now, we can just hard code them in there. That's fine. Okay. So, so I'll just copy this line 25. Yep. Over here. What's wrong with copy and paste? It's, it's, the, it's the best way <laughs> to write code. So, so the, diagnostic ID, what is diagnostic ID? That one I would actually make as a public constant because you may want to ref, you want to reference that in code fixes. So, and that can be is whatever that a string? you want. Yeah, that can be a string. And that's what actually shows up like in your error list. If you see like CS1025 or whatever. Uh, so you could do like Fritz0001 here because this is your first one. Like that. Yep. Cool. All right. I'm important. I'm now part of Visual Studio. All right. <laughs> title. Title should probably be a, a constant just so I don't have it floating around. Yeah. And that can be whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, what I did is I called it. middleware naming. Yep. You can do that. All right. Message format. What is message format? This is basically what's going to show up and say, what did you do wrong? So in our case, we're going to want to say something like, you know, iService collection methods should start with add. All right. So let's, I'll just message format equals iService collection methods should start. Oh, you want to do the, the, the service collection or should we do, I was thinking the middleware. Um, we could do that. This one will be a little easier. I'm watching time. So oh, okay. I think if we, if we oh, do this one, this will... Because the, the, actually the other one is virtually the same thing. So Just with three other things yeah. that we're searching for. Okay. Then you know what? I'm going to change the name of this. And I'll call this um, dependency injection. Uh, let's call it, yeah, dependency injection naming analyzer. God, that is flickering like nobody's business on my screen when you're doing the renaming. That was quite funny. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. There we go. All right. And I'll put a semi here. Cool. Category. That is typically whatever you want. If you Because if you look at your error list down at the bottom, you'll see uh, that's not showing up. So there. it was naming is what it was over there. So let's just reuse that. You can call it naming. Yep, yeah. that's fine. It's a warning, is enabled by default, true. Description is description. What is that? You don't, uh, you can just take that off for now. That's fine. The last one, the description one. All right, so I will remove the description. We're not going to be descriptive. 
<laughs> will be descriptive enough with what we got here. So, all right, cool. Now we just need to do in support diagnostics return an immutable array that has that rule in it. That's pretty simple. All right, so this we're going to say, right, new immutable array rule. That's easy. All right. Did that there, work? It did yeah. work. Okay, cool. All right. They're, they're suggesting we need to publish an analyzer that makes Sweaty Steve pop up when you have a successful build. I've got <laughs> other ideas for that. <laughs> See, this is where all like the evilness starts coming in, or at least the, the not the evilness, that's too far. The, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Creativity? Yes. Uh, <laughs> people start going, oh, excellent. I could do this. And you're the right. obnoxious creativity. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's one way to word it. All right, so we got the support diagnostics initialized. Now this is where we're trying okay. to say we need our stuff to kick off. So what are we actually looking for here? So we're going to be looking for a, it's not a class, it's a static method in a class that extends iServiceCollection. Yep. So we want to register for a symbol that's a method. So I want to see if you can get that in there. So, all right, why don't I, so that we kind of have a reference place because we have to go through and look at that. It'd be great to be able to look at that syntax. Yeah. Why don't I put a class library in here? So let's add a new project. And I'm going to create a .NET Core class library. And I'm going to call this um, sample, uh, yeah, just sample library. Who cares? Yeah. And I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to create a piece of middleware that, not middleware, a static class that extends the iService collection. Yep. So that we can flip over and see in the syntax visualizer what that looks like. Uh, so let's call this uh, service. Oh, one thing to keep in mind, um, you may actually want to do this in, a, in your integration test project and load it here. The, or at least another project. The only reason why is because this is a .NET standard 1.3, and if you're going to try to reference the package that has iService collection in it, it may not actually be able to do it, mm. if that makes sense. Okay, so so I made this .NET Core. Well, .NET Core should, .NET Core 2 should be picked up by .NET standard. You can try it. Um, Typically, this is something that I don't usually do, and, and I just because when analyzers were PCLs, you couldn't really reference anything from them. Mm -hmm. um, so I got used to not actually referencing any of the packages that I wanted to use during my analysis. Um, so if I'm looking for like type names or assembly names, I'd actually have to keep in mind what the real string version of that was rather than referencing the library that had it. Because you just couldn't. Is it, I, there was, is so. it I service provider? Do I have the right name there? I service collection. Is it should be I service collection. Yeah. And that's going to get grouchy because I don't have that. Yep. So, so I need to add. It's a. Uh, it's going to be Microsoft extensions. That's not how you spell extensions. Is it abstractions? Dependency injection, I believe. Dependency injection. Come on. Yeah, because you have to type the yeah. whole thing. For some reason, it doesn't. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm ranting a little bit about no, that no. one. <laughs> oh. As. Yes, you're right. And it's a pain in the neck, and I don't yep. like it. Yeah, I wish the search was a little better than that. But. All right. So this isn't. This is actually not depending on a specific version here when I look at my my version dependencies okay so I should be all right with that because it's just an abstraction all right so I'm make sure we rename the class no don't rename that I want to rename the oh. file won't rename yeah, you're right the file. It, it is abstractions you're right yeah all right so I will say services you just leave a blank for now. That's fine. Do my using. Okay. All right. So I don't care what it does in here. I wanted to find this and get grumpy about it. Yep. Um, damn it. It won't rename my file, so I'm going to force the... 
That's better. All right. Cool. So I've got something that we can look at and actually see the syntax of this. All right. So where should we go now? Um, well, if you go back to your analyzer, mm -hmm. let's try to get that initialized method hooked up again. Okay. So, so again, we're trying to find a method, basically a simple method. Okay. So off of the context. Go for it. You, you have the con. Go ahead. I have the con. Okay. So I go here. Oops. So the context, we need to register what to look for. Yeah. How do I get IntelliSense to show up? It might take an extra second or two to pop up when you control space, is what I've been told. Control space. Or, because <laughs> I'm impatient, I could just do could this. Just, yeah. Copy paste. Yeah. Look at so that. We'll, so we'll just do that. Okay. So this is basically saying anytime you have a method defined, I'm okay. going to call this method. There, that's my callback. All right. So we should generate analyze method. Yes. What happens if you control dot on it? Do you get the generate thing to pop up? No, I don't. Oh. But right. I, I can will... just... Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. So I'm going to generate that method. So now I have a private method called analyze method. Yep. Okay. This should probably be context here. We like good names. Yeah, just for continuity. All right, I'm going to pin and let you go to town. Okay, so I'm just going to put in a bunch of stuff here, and then I'll explain and clean it up as we go along, because I bet not all of it's going to work. Okay. So the first thing, again, is cast it to a method symbol. Okay. And then the next thing is we only care about extension methods. You know, th this is where you got to, again, when you're doing analyzers, you want to think of the filtering capabilities or aspects and and get out as fast as you can so because here, we don't want we don't want these to run unless they have to let me put this in a new horizontal beneath this so we can kind of look at that syntax while all right so okay. so point. you're looking for an extension method right that's an extension method because it extends this object got it all right right so if it's just a stat a regular static method or instance method we don't care and we'll just stop doing Ignore. our stuff okay yep so then the next thing I look at is, well, what's the, the, and if it's an extension method, it should have at least one parameter. Sure. The first one should be the actual thing we're looking at. Right, the this thing down here. Yeah, so that's why I'm doing the this argument type. Okay. Okay. And then I do a couple of weird things here. Um, I'm essentially saying if that name is iService Collection, mm -hmm. And this get full namespace is an extension method I wrote. We'll have to put that in in a second. But essentially what that does is it figures out the namespace for that type. There isn't a way as, as far as I can okay. tell with the compiler API to say, just give me the namespace. You actually have to get each part as you go up all the namespace values. Is that, so that's what. So is this argument type, is that a type? Oh, it's an I type symbol. Yeah, so you don't have the, the, right, I'm thinking on type info, you have get, what is it, get full name, and it gives you the full name of it. Yeah, if it, actually, I'm just curious now, if I did, just to check, quick. yeah, for some reason I'm not getting IntelliSense, but that, this is why I spent the time last night having a backup, because I can just get it, so it I'm, here. I'm just going to control space there and see if we can, yeah, full name isn't there, get right. type is there. Well, no, yeah, get type won't. Hmm. That's the I type symbol. That's what it will give you, not the yeah. type of the parameter. I know you, this gets a little weird at times where you have to think of what you're actually looking at. And so if you did get type, that will not be the thing you want. Is is type kind? Is that? What that's is that? just, that's the, uh, the kind no. of the type. Okay. All um, right. Which isn't what we're looking for either. So this says, is it named I service collection? Okay. So if it's that, then we right. want to look at this extension method and hopefully it comes back and says the full namespace is Microsoft extensions dependency injection and is the assembly that contains it, is its name this? Now I could probably even go farther and do like the full assembly name and the version and all that stuff, but for now we'll just deal with this. Okay, yeah. now I'm getting a red squiggle under get full namespace. Am I missing? Yeah, that's an extension method I have got to add for you. Oh, so, okay. Um, Let's see. Can I actually add um, folders to this? 
I well remember we had a problem with it adding a class. Why don't we just add it as a class right beneath here? Yeah. Okay. Let me do that. Um, so I'll grab and we'll this. move it around. You can move it around as you need it. That's yeah. fine. So I will put it. And standby reloading is asking, can we do type of on any of that or name of? Well, no. name of will give us the string name. Yes. Um, but again, if you do um, name of on yeah anything in here, it's just like you said, the string. If I did type of, it's the it's going to be the type which is let me get my hovering over here. I type be I type symbol, yeah. which is not the type of the parameter that's in the, the extension method. Okay. So, all right. So now I got that git full namespace in there. You should see that at the bottom. Yeah. Let's let me just take a peek and show folks what this is doing. So you're going after a symbol and you're saying go get the containing namespace and you're just concatenating together. Right. That. It's okay. a quick and dirty way just to create the, the namespace there. Gotcha. All right. So we've got all that. And then the last thing is if all those are true, then if that method doesn't start with add, now right. we've got a problem. Okay. So instead of it, it says right now, do something cool. Well, that's a problem because it doesn't start with add. All right. Yeah. And so, so now I change that. So it's going to report a diagnostic at the location of where that method is defined based on the rule with all the title and message format stuff that you just put up at the top. Okay. Gotcha. That seems pretty straightforward. I mean, we're literally looking for, for at the arguments to make sure it's an extension method, extending iService collection, and then we're checking the name of it to make sure to enforce that naming convention. Cool. Right. That's, yep. th that, that seems really easy. I mean, this is what, six lines of code? And it's only six lines because we have word wrap turned on. Yeah, I, again, the, the real crux of it is, yes, I, I made this this extension, but actually this uh, get full namespace works with any symbol anywhere. So you can, this is a nice reusable extension method, but the actual analyze method is where all the magic happens. And it's really not, not that much. There's not, for this one, There's it's pretty straightforward. So. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I've, I've, I've got all these naming conventions that I want to enforce going through my head, but yeah. okay. So, so let's, let's do this. Let's run it and see if it actually finds the right ones first. It, and it, and it enforces and gets upset about do something cool. Yes. All right. So I will click start. Sushinator says one could do the whole name and namespace check within an extension method. Potentially, yes. That's another, you know, there's sure. lots of ways to skin the cat with this stuff. All right. So I am That going... sounds really violent because I love cats. There's a lot, a lot of different ways to solve the problem. <laughs> Let's just All put right, it that so way. I'm going to reach in here and I'm going to reach into sample library and open this CS proj. Oh, it's going to load the whole solution. Eh, that's not too bad. Come on. Oh, this is the the full project that you did. <laughs> yeah, and now I'm getting the attempting to add a ready known thread. <laughs> so here's the yeah yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, that should be hiding down there. Go away, output window. All right, object reference not set to an instance of an object. Um, That's interesting. Private static rule, which is a new. Hmm. <coughs> New immutable array rule, and rule is a thing. Huh. You know what? Um, I don't know why that would happen. I've never seen that one before. Usually the way I create an immutable array is I just use immutable array dot create, and then I just pass in the descriptor there. All right, let's do that then. Uh, I, I, but I don't know why that would work better or worse than what you have. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So if we did immutable array dot. Yeah, you don't need the, the uh, generic there if you don't want to. There it is, create. Um, MT, MT Lich, welcome. So this is supposed to be diagnostic. And you don't need the generic there either. You can oh. just pass in rule and it'll figure it all out. Uh-huh. And like 
Oops, wrong way. And this time when you run it, don't run it under the debugger. Um, Disconnect the debugger? Yeah, just launch it um, without debugging and then we'll see what that does. Start without debugging. Let it break. Yes, control F5. That's your friend. <laughs> yeah, all right. And so let's open that project. It's so meta, opening the same project. By the way, I'm switching to my water cup now and regions, so. <laughs> All right, so it should find, absolutely. It should find do something cool here and give me a warning. It should, if it gets to that point. There we go, I got a green line and I mouse Let's over see. it. There we go, I yes. service collection method should start with that. So there you go. Right, that's the text that we had inside of. Now, if you change it and just put add in front of it, it should go away. Let's t let's make sure that's the case. So if I make this add do something cool, it goes away. Okay. Terrific. So We're good. Our, our simple check there worked. Yep. All right. So I'm going to, I'm, I can close this now, and we can now talk about writing a uh, code no, fix. Writing a code fix. And, and the code fix is what's going to put the add in front of it. Right. And... You know, again, you could think about, well, do I remove like the first three letters or so? You get really weird at this, but I think you're right. The the right thing to do is just say, well, the simple way to fix this is just and start it with Stick add. Stick the word add in front of it. Yeah. Right. And, and right, it, you, you and have if, that you have that opportunity to review the change. So even though yes. we just we just Borg glommed on there the word add, right? We could you have the opportunity there to remove the do so it's just add something cool. You can do that, or you know, the, the in this case, the developer could just say, "Well, I don't just want to stick add on it. I want to stick add and then remove these things." So they could go in and just rename it themselves. It's up mm. to them. So, but okay. let's do that as a code fix. Okay. So uh, should I start another class here for yes. the code fix? All right. So I'm going to make sure I'm in the right project, and I'm going to Alt Shift C. This is a class. So it is is a good naming practice to call this the same thing as the analyzer, but code fix. So in in this case, oh, it's middleware naming analyzer. I got to rename that. But dependency injection naming code fix? You could, I mean, that's fine. I I get really long-winded with my names on these because um, then I know exactly what the code fix does, but it's whatever you want to call it. There's no real rhyme or reason to this. It, you know, whatever makes sense so that you look at it later, oh, that's what the code fix does. Yeah, I'm thinking that they're they're almost paired up, right? An analyzer triggers a code fix. Well, it can trigger a code fix or it can trigger many. Oh. Because that ID that we made as a constant, you can have code fixes that are saying, hey, I can fix this diagnostic, and I can fix this diagnostic, and you get a bunch of them that can do that. Okay. So, so if I if I change, let's call this dependency injection naming mm, add prefix? That's fine. No, I'd end it with the word code fix, because then you know it's a code fix class. So dependency injection naming add prefix code fix. Sure. That's let's do that. We're verbose here in C-sharp. <laughs> All right, so we'll make this a public class. And real quick, before I get too far into this, I'm going to rename the file here. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, it didn't give me the option to rename the file. So I will F2 this and that, and now my file's renamed. Yeah, somebody said, sounds like you need a folder reach analyzer and put the code fix in. You can do that too. I mean, that's that actually sounds like an interesting way to keep these all structured. You can have an analyzer's folder and then put each one in there. It's oh really gosh. however you want to do it. So Right. So just following that line of thought, and I, I like where you're going with that uh, standby reloading. So if we had dependency injection naming, we could have just analyzer.class in here and then add prefix code fix in here. And we remove all this stuff at the beginning because that's part of our namespace. Yeah. Yeah, we can, we'll we leave it this way for now, but yeah, there's, yeah. You, can, you can get really nice and organized with this if you want. Oh totally my gosh. fine. Yep. And uh, Dark Legit is saying, uh, tuned into a Java EE uh, project here. No, no, we're not that bad with our naming. <laughs> wow. <laughs> 
We didn't use the word factory and uh, other things yet, so we're good. Right. All right, so does this... So I'm going to close our other one here. So this is a code fix, right? Does this... Yep. Well, it's... This is so we're going to want to... Provider. Yeah, we're going to want to steal a couple things we had from the, the one that was generated with okay. the uppercasing name. So first I'm going to start off with... Let's make sure I'm her inheriting from the right class. Yep. All right, and it's going to want me to implement a couple things. Yep. All right. And then there was a header here, export code fix provider, and then a name of. All right, so let's copy that. And I get to name something else. Uh, well, it's name of, oops, we're going to need those. Uh, name of that's just the class that you have there yeah. yeah and what's shared here um is that something I'm missing? using system you, composition all right yeah the the, the attributes here are meth based uh, and so i don't i have to be honest i don't quite know what that shared is going to do but i always put it on there just reasons <laughs> so. it's it's shared with other things sure i'll no, go with that makes sense Okay, right, so, so you this up there. Yep. Okay. So fixable diagnostic ID. So this probably should hook up back to, right? Uh, not that one. To this diagnostic ID. Right. You want to create an immutable array that has an ID in it. Yep. All right. So let's do. Uh, oh, it was immutable array. Dot create. And then it'd be really great if I just brought in. Um, from my dependency naming analyzer diagnostic ID. Yep, and you're done with that. Cool. No magic strings here. All right. Right. Now there is another method that you could override, which is called get fix all provider. That um, I when I created my class, I just said provide overrides for everything, and that's one of them. Um, you don't have to do that. There's like different fix all providers. This is getting kind of beyond what we want to talk about today, mm -hmm. but that's another one you can do. And then there's just batch fixer that you return. So we'll actually just leave that off for now. Maybe I'll sneak that in as you're coding some other stuff here. Um, actually, did I? Oh crap! I'm not seeing the. Uh... You're not seeing the new file yet. Well, all right. Let's try. They were saying try building first. Let's try building and see if that pops it over to you. Okay. So I just ran the build. Did it succeed? It did. But did you get it? No, I did not. So uh, you know we're gonna we're gonna where's the we're gonna join, try that. leave copy there link. You so you can see Jason's initials up here when he connects and disconnects. Then we'll join back to it. And I think this is actually an open issue that the folks are working on for live share. There we are. Okay. And you're back. And I see all this stuff. Cool. So I'm going to take this code. I'm just going to throw it in here. I don't know if that requires any uh, usings up in the top. That no, it looks good. good. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this, again, just like the other one, the register code fixes async. That's where the, uh, the stuff is that we wanted. That's where we want to do all the stuff that we want to do. Yeah. So, um, Dark Legit is asking uh, the name default, the name on the export code fix provider. It seems kind of silly to have name equals name of this thing that I'm attached to. That's not a bad comment there. That if it's if we're attaching this attribute to a class that we want to export, you shouldn't have to specify the name. It already knows what we're attached to. Yeah, actually, I've. With previous analyzers I've written for other things, I don't think I've actually specified the name. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like with the template that they did for 2017, they updated it, so it just automatically generates name and, and suggests using the name of the class. You know, I, I, for now, let's just leave it there because I, I know it'll work, but you know, maybe for other things you're right, give it better name. Okay. Know. So, all right, so register code fix async. I know we're going to want to make this async. Yeah. So we'll do that. Um, and then I'm just, I'll do like I did last time. We're just going to blast through and put some stuff in here. Rather than, uh... All 
Right. So now you've added a whole bunch of code there. It looks like I'm going to need to bring in some Link. namespaces. Yeah. Yeah. To do that quick. So I will bring that in. Method declaration syntax. Let's bring that. Uh, code action. We need that. And then we need a uh, generate a method for prefix nope, method with that. Oh, just did we do that for you. I am your generator. Look at that. <laughs> All right, so we can get rid of the other one here. Cool. And then there's this renamer. And that should get rid of all the red, hopefully. There we go. Is there still two at the top? Oh, it's for title. So we need a title for this. Oh, yeah. Um, let me give you a title here. And that will be this. Okay, prefix method with that. That makes that, that makes perfect sense. That's a, all right. All right. So let's let's talk about what we're actually doing in this register code fixes. Okay. So the first four lines here are the ones that I talked about before. That's just kind of that boilerplate of I need to get back to the method declaration syntax. Okay. Yeah. So once I'm there, then I'm going to register code fix based on this prefix method with add. And this is going to be almost identical to what we saw with the class renaming to uppercase. It's just we're going to do it with um, the method name where we're just going to say, hey, I want to change this to add whatever you had before. Fantastic. So we're using a little string interpolation there to just stick the word add in front of the, the name of that method. That's yep. easy. And that's it. We're going to do the renamer. We're going to go across the solution, blah, blah, blah. Same stuff so, we saw before. And, and going across the solution, it's going to fix all the references to this. Yes. That's the nice thing. Because you could, you could just change the method declaration syntax and create a new one and then tell the tree to replace it just in this file. And that would be fine. But then you're potentially breaking other places in your code that didn't get that rename. Mm. So that's so, what's nice about the renamer. So lines 49, 50, and 51, those are the things that I'm selecting in that pop-up box that says rename this. That's me selecting, well, it, it gives a reference to the original solution, but then the option set, that's that's all those options that I'm choosing in there for which ones to update. Yes, I believe awesome. so. Yeah, awesome. so this, this essentially now, if everything works, now if you rerun the code, not only will you see the squiggle, but now we should get a fix in place. Oh, man. Oh, shoot. I forgot to put, say, turn off the debugger. That's, That's okay. fine. We'll, we'll live I'm getting that. used to breaking out of the session and getting back in again. <laughs> well, it's nice. The one thing that's nice is that when you do that uh, collaboration link, it remembers the last one. So I just have yeah. to hit, I don't have to keep copying it. So that's nice. All right. So we're opening the sample library. Here we go. You're all giddy. I love this. <laughs> Coffee. It's a saying. beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you. And I've got I've got more antibiotics in me this morning than I can count. Oh, wow. Antibiotics and steroids. I'm I'm speaking at a conference next week, and let me tell you, I am going to be all hopped up on all kinds of stuff. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, all right. define wonderful. All right. Uh, I'm in Florida, and I'm going to have a cold. It's terrible yeah all right so now i've got uh, all right so all the package manager stuff at setup is being run through so there i've got my green line and i've got i've got my quick actions light bulb here so if i click that prefix myth method with that and check that out it's it's got that little ad just jammed in the front so if i click preview changes here's where the, those options are yep very cool so yeah, if you had referenced this anywhere else in your code, it would fix you, those other said, places. Yep. Awesome. That's, All automatic. Yeah. I mean, it it seems just right. It it's right. It feels too. Um, all right. If I say project. So there's all the different places now. Right. I, I can actually change the name of it here. Right. I could just say add something cool. Right? Can you have ever me, tried that? No, no, it won't let me backspace or delete. Anything. Okay. But I, I could cancel out of this and say, oh, you're right, and I could rename it myself 
with my rename refactoring and it, the problem would go away, right? I'll do F2 and I'll just change this to add something cool, press enter and my line is gone. That's awesome stuff. It's too easy. It, it, <laughs> it feels so easy to write and, and be able to enforce. And somebody, I forget who it was who was suggesting it in the, in the chat room was saying when they're updating methods, when they've got a standard, a coding standard they want to enforce, this feels like the, a quick and dirty way to write something, inject it as a, as a reference into everybody's project, and now they're being forced to name that appropriately. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, but, and, and keep in mind that the, the analyzer and the code fix we just did here for everybody watching is, is arguably fairly simple, straightforward. I mean, oh you're gosh, just, yeah. you're just putting a name in here, but oh my God, the, the possibilities that you can do with this go far beyond this. For example, let me just uh, give one quick one here. Sure. I've um, written, I'll save um, and close out of here so you can show. Okay. Um, well, I'm not going to show. I'll just describe it real quick. Um, so there's a, um, a package out there that somebody that I work with at Magenic, um, Rocky Laka, which people may know the name, um, he's written a business object library called CSLA. And I've used it before, and there's things I like about it and things I struggle with on it. Mm -hmm. But as I have been using it over the years, I've noticed there are some times where I'm like, you know what, I wish, you know, there, there's these conventions that this library wants me to do, but it can't be enforced by the compiler. This may sound familiar with other libraries that people use. Um, so, for example, all your business objects should be marked as serializable. Mm. So it's an easy thing to do, and it's an easy thing to forget. Um, there's another one like in WCF, if you mark a method is one way, you can't return a value. You have to return void. Mm -hmm. But if you return a value, um, the compiler is not going to yell at you. It's only when you try to run the service would it yell at you. That it, it complains at you. You get right. that. Yeah. So, mm. so what I did is I wrote an analyzer for CSLA that says, if you've defined a business object that isn't marked as serializable, then throw up an analyzer and then provide a code fix to not only add the serializable attribute on it, but also look at your using statements. Because if you already have using system in there, I shouldn't put it in there again. But if you don't, I need it. So then I put that in as well. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to flip back over to the analyzer here. If I yep. wanted to inspect the attributes that are on my type. So this is returning a method. If I instead yeah. was returning a type, I could inspect that type and check to see the attributes that are decorated on it. You could actually. I'm, g give me one second here. I, it uh, it crashed on me again, so I oh, gotta no. start. Um, while you're doing that, Dark Legit asks in the in the chat room. I apologize for being a nuisance. No apology needed. That's why we have a chat room, so exactly. you can ask questions. Where would this be hosted? I'm trying to look at the export code fix provider attribute and came across CodePlex. So sorry that you're in CodePlex. Yeah. But yes, <laughs> you want to be in GitHub, .NET, Roslyn, Blob, Master, Workspaces, Core, Portable, Code Fixes, Export, Code Fix, Pro that looks like it. This is Roslyn, right? Yes. Yes. And yes, I think you're in the right spot. Um, yeah, he is. Yep. I we we had a hint yesterday that some of the folks from the Rosalind team were going to drop in on on the on the stream this morning. If anybody from the Rosalind team is out there, can you comment on no. that? If not, um, let's um, let's. Wait, take if that he question. says where would this be hosted, if he's asking like where the code is for all this stuff, that link is correct. Yeah. That... Yeah, I think you're right on that link. Um, so. Yeah, definitely not Coplex. <laughs> no. It was there, it, and then they moved like everybody else. Mm -hmm. So that's. I think you're in the right place there, Dark Legit. And let me know if I'm pronouncing your name right. So it's always so, fun to read some of these handles that people have. Yeah. So you were asking about attributes on the. Uh, which one did you call? Oh yeah, this one. Right. So, so if I just. Right. Ooh, where are you at? You're somewhere else. I'm on the analyzer. Uh, yeah, that one. No, oh, you're, yeah, I'm on the same one. I should be. I'm pinning to you. Go ahead and move, your, move around, move your cursor. It's not seeing you. It doesn't like me. It says I joined. And I, I can see you. Yeah. Oh, no. We've broken it. 
<laughs> broken everything. <laughs> oh wow, I can't right click either. Yeah. You're using the preview version of Visual Studio, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know if that it matter, but anyway. Well let me just see if I can if I do well, that's interesting. Now I can't even type in this. I'm going to go back to my backup. I'm so glad I did this. This is a, a good rule to follow. Always have a plan B. Um, I wonder so if I, I'm wondering if I need to restart the sharing session. Yeah, maybe. But just to answer the question, if you would dot off of the method um, variable in analyze method, there is get attributes. So you could look at all the attribute data that's on that method and oh, potentially yeah. look for things that way. Okay. So that, that's why I said stuff from the, the semantic model, the symbols that you get, they feel like you're in reflection. They're not quite there, but you know, things that you would typically do in reflection will kind of, um, there'll be like analogies to that in your symbols. Okay. So, so and, and reflection for folks that aren't familiar with it, right? That's how you can walk across your code using code and kind of inspect types and different things. So, right, I'm looking at a type and I'm or a method here, and I can see all the things about that method. So there's get full namespace as an extension method. That's your extension. Very cool. Yeah. All right. So, so we're at 20 minutes left, approximately. Let's, um, um, well, let's commit this. Let's push this up. Okay. So we've got, and you know what? Um, I'm going to remove those other two analyzers that we don't need anymore, the default ones. Yep. Uh, get rid of that. All right, so I'm going to save everything. Uh, no, don't need that. So now here I will get status. Let's make sure everything's here. Sure. Um, yeah, add everything. That's fine. And get commit. Uh, first commit with Jason Bach. Cool. Get push. And now we've got source code on GitHub. Cool. Terrific. All right. So this will be the first of like hundreds that you write. Hundreds. <laughs> hundreds. We're going to become we're going to become code enforcement policemen. Exactly. All right. So so I've got this one out here. Now, how do I bring this analyzer into my stream tools project? so that I can use it over there and be able to reference it? Oh, you would ask that question, wouldn't you? Um, so there should, again, it's if you want to use the extension or you want to use the package. So if you went into the extensions project, there should probably be a v6 file somewhere in the bin directory, I would so imagine. So there's a, if I were to go in the folder for this, I'm going to open folder in File Explorer under bin, debug, and there's a V6. So that's great if I'm installing it in my Visual Studio for all of my projects. Right. So that's one way to do it. That's if one way. If you go to, let me make sure. Yeah, so if you go into the actual analyzer project under like bin or debug, bin debug, there should be a new pack. The new, wait, a, wait a second. This thing right there, you called it a new pack? <sighs> Nupkig. Well, how there are we, we to go. Say that? Yep. <laughs> a nupkeg, Nup isn't that the, the right pronunciation? Absolutely. That's that's what that's what David Fowler says it should be. That's what. And Scott folks, Hanselman doesn't want that. So. I tell you, the boss the boss can learn a thing or two here. <laughs> I'm um, just gonna I'm just gonna get my popcorn and eat that. I'm not I've, even gonna get into that one. When you're when um, you're pushing these things around all day, uh, new pack. I get it, but nupkeg. There you go. Okay. That does sound better. So this is the the one that you could. I've actually never tried it this way, but you could try and just say <coughs> reference this package from your project and see if what what should hopefully happen so is I'm, you'll see it in your project. So I'm going to copy this. I actually have I keep a local NuGet okay. here, so I'm just going to copy it into there and I'm going to open my other project and try to add a reference to it. So recent projects. So this is my stream tools project, our ongoing ASP.NET Core project. And I I want to be able to add it as an analyzer so that then other folks who clone my project 
are able to get that same type of code enforcement. Which I yes. think I, I feel like they, that's you, a that's a good. You have practice. to have the the uh, the package um, either in your repo or you want to publish it to NuGet and then reference it that way. Oh yeah, yeah. So. Um, because it's going to add it as a package reference. Yep. So I'm going to change <clears> my package source here to local. And Let's which one is it? Finds it. No, that's not where I want to be. Did I put it over here? Is that what I called it? Nope, that's not what I called it. What did I call it? I don't know. <laughs> I had a thing. Local, see NuGet. All right, so go to local. There it is. Fritz Analyzers by, yeah, look at that. All right, so we will install that. It's going to take forever to download. Yeah, like, like minutes. Minutes. Cool. That's interesting. Easy. Um, hmm, 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 hmm. Did it All say right. it was successful? It did. Executing NuGet actions. So it's there. Now, look at this. I got all these red lines. It's very grumpy. Well, we'll see why. Because it contains lowercase letters. So that still thinks it has the. Uh... Because I, I didn't. Yeah. All right, hang on. Is this Visual Studio one that is like the experimental hive? No. Hmm. All right, so let's go. Let's go back to the other project and let's rebuild that. Oops. Uh, oh, you didn't rebuild it after you took those classes out. Exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, That's what you did. Uh, so my bad. Thinking all those classes are badly named. <laughs> my bad. All right, rebuild solution. So it'll clear out all that stuff. Give me brand new, fresh bits. Rebuild all failed. Now I feel bad. Oh, well, because, because, yeah, just delete that test file for now. We'll, we'll talk briefly about tests at the end. We're running a little short on time, but that's fine. Um, and you might have to delete some of the ver the, those other two folders. But I think that's why, is because the test projects are generated to do stuff with those, um, the analyzer and cofix that were generated originally. There we go. Rebuild all succeeded. So I'm going to come back over here and let's go find, there's my new 1.0 NUPKEG. Yeah, but you didn't do Simver. Oh, I'm just replacing it. I didn't publish it yet. <laughs> and it should be Simver. It should be like 0 0.1. Yeah. We'll get back to that. Uh, all right. So file and we'll open this one. Okay, yeah, fine. Do your Docker thing. All right, so I want to manage NuGet packages. <clears throat> All right, local, refresh. Come on, it's there, load it. <laughs> it really doesn't want to show it. There it is. There we go. All right, install. And now I shouldn't get all of those red lines. Hopefully. So far, but so But that good. was kind of cool, though. No, 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 they're back. So, is it is it getting confused because it's the same version? No, I uninstalled it. Oh, okay. Right, so it's uninstalled, it's gone, and we'll see the red lines disappear. Cool. Um, why does it think it's there? Go to your, just curious, um, go to your tools extensions. I just want to make absolutely sure that this didn't, when we were playing with this. Oh, that it didn't get installed. Yeah, you'll see. Well, th so this is from the code. I mean, I mean, in the project that you're currently in with all the, uh, um, your Fritz streaming stuff. Right, right. Well, it's not here. Here, when I'm looking at the analyzer project. Okay, go to the other one then. Let's just make sure it's that it's not hanging around. Uh, oops, wrong one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, just just go to tools extensions here. I want to make absolutely sure it's not. Though, which it yeah it won't be, be because you're not seeing any of the errors right now so right. it still thinks it's in that package for some reason all right and i'm not sure why let's try one you know what even if it is let's just try it again with the nuget reference 
And oh no, I'm going to remove that. I'm going to remove that little guy real quick here. Let's let's go. I'm going to open. I'm not going to let uh, fall for this sitting down. Let's delete that. <laughs> right. Let's go back here to this. I'm going to delete that nupkeg. I'm going to delete that net standard folder. And let's rebuild this guy. All right. Owner Jeffer. Yeah. So it would say owner C sharp Fritz. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hanselman was on as a guest last week yes he was I also reject the nupkeg pronunciation John Galloway you are a bad bad person <laughs> alright so there's my nupkeg um, I'm going to copy that control C and right copy yep. alright I'm going to go back up here I'm going to go into my new get folder paste that so that's 1147 that's right now okay try it one more time recent projects stream tools right we can well, get that renamed janescu that's just some notation inside my uh inside the project all right so now i'll do manage where's it manage new get packages manage nup kegs <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm nothing if not you know Persistent. Persistent. Beating a dead horse, which is bad idea. I shouldn't say that anymore because I actually have horses. There it is. Okay. Uh, look at it. Project goes. here. URL here. Yeah, we need to fix that at some point. Yeah. Before we publish this out. Ta -ta -ta. Restore completed. Nope. Look at that. It still sees it. Actually, just open the the uh, file up. Let's just see if it actually is getting our analyzer. Just ignore that. Do you, do you have any extension methods that you made the service collection? I don't. Well, I uh, wait a sec. Yes, <clears throat> yes, I do actually. Look at that. Configure stream services. It should be add stream services. Look at that. There you go. It actually found what, you know, it found a bug in your code. And look, it's I've done it all over the place. I'm a bad, bad person. But this would fix it everywhere. It would. Oh my gosh. Add configure stream service. I really want it to be add stream service. So let's, I'm going to change that. Can I do change signature? No, I don't want to change the signature. I want to rename it. So let's do an F2 on that and I'll rename it to add stream service. Yeah, the one thing with the the code fix is if we could make it a little bit more interactive to say um, rename with to and then you provide a suggestion with add, but then you could also rename it to get rid of the word configure after it. There's there's mm. no real easy way to do that as far as I know. There might okay. be, but again, this this just says hey we should change it to add, but then you're going to have add configure like you said, and then you can just F2 on it and change it and get it essentially the same thing. Yeah. But yeah, now it's all fixed. So that's fixed, but it's also complaining the name configure services contains lower I service collection should start with add. So I've got it somewhere else in here. Oh, look yeah. at this. It's actually searching for my error. I need to document <laughs> that somewhere. Yes, you could you could do that. Just throw up a, a URL somewhere and put some documentation around it. So put it in throw up a URL somewhere, put it in the wiki for this project. That's a great that. idea. All right, so I have the same thing here where this should be, well, I already have add stream service. This should be add, see, now this feels really bad. This should be like add all services or add streaming services. And I've, it feels bad because I've got two methods that are almost the exact same name. Hmm. All right. You know, somebody's in the chat mentioning that you, you might actually have to do the, the bump the version thing. Um, it for, maybe for whatever reason, it's just not forgetting that original analyzer. I don't know. You're right. It's not because if we go user profile, there is, where is it? Dot new get packages. Da, da, da. I think I already went past it. Look, there's cake. Fritz analyzers, 100. And that's the old version from 11.43. The last version we had was 11.48. Uh -huh. So it's actually cached here locally. 
Yep. Which it's interesting though that it gets the new one too. So, but you you already had it in when you built it the first time. That's why. Okay. So I'm going to uninstall that one. I'm going to come over here to my cache and delete it. Go away. <laughs> Shoo. Right. Delete. All right. It's gone. Okay. And so now I'll reinstall. And it went away. There we go. So all the other ones went away. And now I but still have. A... Yeah. So those are the. Right. I service collection should start with add on line 94. There you go. That was the problem. Configure ASP.NET features. Oh my gosh. Right. That should be add ASP.NET features. Right. So I'll prefix it. And then I'll just do a quick rename and remove the word configure. So is there a way to provide multiple, you said there was a way to provide multiple code fixes? Yes, right. you can. You can, well, you can make one code fix class file and then do a bunch of register code fix actions within it. If we did the other one with the IA application builder, because there's like three things you can start mm. with. When I wrote that analyzer, that's what I did. I had one code fix class, but I registered three code fix actions so with each of the three renamings in front of it. Let me just go back so we can see that code. Yes, I will save those changes. But I, I won't push that up yet. I, I don't want to publish it until I have the analyzers published. So, so we were looking here. You had, all right, so this is the method that does the fix. So we're registering that code fix. This is one of the code fixes and yep. the, the title for it. So you could add another one here that does something slightly different. Yep. So exactly. j just thinking out loud, I could say context register code fix, right? And I'll put a semi there at the end of that, right? Here's where my typing's gonna get clumsy. Uh, code action create, okay? Title, and I could call this like replace first word with add right yeah if you're doing like pascal casing then you could do some smarts around finding the first thing in front of it and removing that maybe exactly right replace and i could call this replace first word with add context document right and i'm thinking this is like almost the exact same thing that you already wrote except was equivalence key is the same as the title all right so we'll just copy that down yeah you do that's a good point though you do want the equivalence key to be different with all the ones you're doing yeah all right and then diagnostic uh oops i've got too many so if i did that then i could add this so now I've got that same thing. So where I had prefix method with add, right? I'm gonna do almost the exact same thing in here, except like you were saying, I could, instead of new name being add identifier token, I could look for that second capitalization, strip off those and replace it. Yeah, and it doesn't, the, there's like a humanizer library. Doesn't that do something with like parsing strings for Pascal, I'm not sure. But if yeah. there's a library oh, yeah. that you could find out there to do that, just reference that one and do your string parsing manipulation that way. So but yeah, that you could definitely do this easily. So, um, cancellation token is what this should be named. Uh huh. Method declaration syntax method document. So why is it upset at this? Get document. Model async. Oh, because I didn't, this isn't marked as async. Got it. That's better. So, right, I will just add to do. That's not to do. Uh, replace first word in method name. Cool. And I want to wrap up there because we are right at time. Yep. And I don't want to keep you too long here. 
this was really cool. I'm, I've I've learned something here about how easy it is to to do some of these simple code enforcement things. I mean, I thought I thought just writing an analyzer would be difficult, but this feels really easy. How you showed us to walk through and be able to identify, oh, we're looking for a method. And the method, it's an extension method. So let's look at the argument type, make sure it's the right one we're looking for. This feels like exactly what we would mentally do. It was just a matter of, of us learning the names and, and some of these different methods and properties to inspect to go through there. That's very cool. And yeah. I'm surprised it's so little code to be able to extend and enhance Visual Studio. Yeah, it's it. That's one of the surprising things I found too. Is again, even with fairly complicated ones, for even if you have to write a little bit, you know, a little bit more code than what we showed here, it's typically not a lot. You'd think, oh, I'm dealing with the compiler API and syntax trees and semantic analysis, and oh my god, this is just going to be a huge amount of code. I'm not a computer it, science person. I don't know the science of writing languages and and yeah. syntax tree. I don't know what this is, but my gosh, the way you broke it down for us, Jason, this is real easy for me to understand. Yeah, and and give credit to the the Roslyn team. I mean that they made it easy to understand. It, you know, it's it's still you're still dealing with the compiler API, but given what you're dealing with, the the API that you end up with is fairly easy to get your head around, relatively speaking, mm. which is really nice. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Uh, let's see. So uh, folks there in the chat room are saying we should name this Stream Tools Analyzer. No, I want this to be something easier for. Just ASP.NET Core projects, right? If we build more, you know, let's let's enforce and do those simple standard things that we might need. Best takeaway today, syntax visualizer. Most tutorials I've seen leave that out. Thank you. Hey, that's great. You're Thank welcome. you, Sushinator. Yeah. All right. There, and there's other tools out there, too, that you can use. We don't have time to go through those, but there's a couple other ones. Look up Roslyn Quoter. That's a great one if you need to generate new trees. That's oh, a great okay. one. okay. So. Okay. Cool. So I am going to commit this last change that we made. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it into a dev branch. Um, Git checkout B, and I'll call this feature um, add. No, replace first name. Just so we have some place to put it for right uh, now. Ah yes. Right. Uh, Git status. Let's make sure. Uh, yeah, we're good with that. So I will do a commit am and started work on replacing the first word of an extension method all right cool uh let's get push of course i forgot always forget this origin feature replace first name and we didn't talk about it today but you can definitely write unit tests for these. In fact, I strongly recommend them. We just didn't get time to go through that, but I've written those for the ones we talked about today, and it's relatively straightforward too to get those to work. A couple of other things you need to do there, but highly encourage people to write unit tests for this stuff because you need to. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, everything's committed and in the source code repository. Um, there you go. You can see where I started this. If you wanted to, if you want to share those unit tests, you want to push those up and, and create a pull request. Um, I'd really appreciate it. We can keep poking yeah. at this um, in some of our other streams coming up here. But thank you so much for the for sharing this with us. I like I said, I learned a lot. Um, I definitely want to get this put into NuGet so that going forward. I can help to enforce some of these standards in my projects at the very least. And if other people find them useful, um, maybe they'll use them also. Cool. Cool. Thanks so much, Jason. As always, I'll uh, put the archive of this over on the YouTube channel in just a little bit after we finish up. Thank you, everybody in the chat room for tuning in. Thank you, Standby Reloading, for the bits today and to all our new followers. Thanks for joining us. Um, hope you join me on Thursday where my guest will be Jonathan Carter, and we're going to talk more about Visual Studio Live Share. And I think he's got a couple other things he wants to share us about the, share with us about the project. Um, I'm really excited to hear what he has to say. So thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. See you.